going to go ahead and get started. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Welcome, everybody. No, just fine. Um, on behalf of the David Fowler Career Center and GW Cyber, I want to welcome all of you to this panel discussion about opportunities at the World Bank and the IFC. Um, I'm Susan Usich. I no longer work at the World Bank, but I did for about 10 years um, and worked in the HR division. Can't hear back there? Is it better like, no? Any better now? No, still not working? That's a light. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is definitely it. All right, how about if I just speak a little louder? I've got young kids, so I can speak very loud. Um, young, young, young. So I did work at the World Bank for about 10 years, and I left a couple of years ago, and I'm just delighted to be moderating this panel. So I want to thank Sandeep for inviting me. Um, we have a very distinguished panel here, and I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves, although you do all have or will have a handout with their bios. Do you have it right now? I don't know if you have it. But they will give a brief introduction of themselves um, just to kick this off. And then we'll start by asking um, a few questions of the whole group and then some individuals. And then we'll open it up for questions from all of you. Does that sound like a plan? OK, great. Well, why don't we get started? Roberto, why don't you start by just introducing yourself? OK. OK. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, everybody. My name is Roberto Amorosino. Uh, I work at the bank in a team that is called Talent Search and Partnerships Group. Uh, used to be called the Recruitment Unit, just to understand what, what we do. Um, my work is very much focused on external recruitment and uh, outreach activities. Uh, I joined the bank uh, back in 1994 as a consultant. I was a consultant for a few years between Washington and, and the Paris office of the bank. Then from Paris, I moved to the Rome office of the World Bank. And uh, a couple of years ago, I moved back here to Washington, D.C. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, sorry to be late. I have no sense of direction. My name is Veronica Bongo. Uh, I work at the IFC. Uh, I'm a HR manager there. I actually joined the IFC. So I, I don't know if you're all familiar. IFC is the International Finance Corporation which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. Um, I joined 18 months ago, so I'm fairly new to the multilateral world. I come from the private sector. I've worked you know, all my life in the private sector, so I see that there are some questions here that I'm really very happy to answer. Um, I'm originally, I was born in Belgium. I have a Congolese father. Uh, I worked around the globe before joining the World Bank, so I think it's pretty, uh, you know, it's good to work for a World Bank. Um, my job is more a general HR type of job with a global scope. 80% um, of uh, the staff I represent are actually not in Washington, D.C. They're based uh, in the what we call the country offices in developing markets, so not in Paris. Um, and I'll, I'm very happy to be here today. Welcome. My name is Bob King. Okay? I've been with the bank for 28 years. Um, as an economist, as a communication specialist, and now as an advisor to the chief information officer. Um, probably the most relevant thing to me being here today, though, is that I'm a GW grad. Uh, BA, MA, and PhD, all here. Uh, my wife is a GW grad. In fact, I met her here as an undergraduate. And my oldest daughter is a GW grad, so I've got a lot of ties to this university. And I'm doing career counseling over at the Career Center uh, as a volunteer these days, too. So I'm uh, very happy to be here. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Eric Schlesinger, uh, Senior Human Resources Officer. I've been with the uh, World Bank for 15 years, uh, so that makes me the junior member of the team, I guess, or somewhat junior. Um, my work is in what we call client services, and I'm currently working with the Multilateral Investment Guarantee uh, Agency, or MEGA. One of the things that you're probably going to hear a lot from us here this afternoon is acronyms because we don't speak English at the World Bank. We speak acronyms and bankees. So uh, certainly if we're saying something that doesn't make sense to you, please raise your hands and we'll do it a quick translation uh, for you. Uh, prior to coming to the World Bank, I was director of recruiting for a management consulting firm. And uh, prior to that, I was the director of the Career Center at Georgetown University, uh, and before that at Catholic University, and also very happy to be with you this afternoon. Wonderful. Welcome to all of you. Um, 
I think we'll sort of kick this off by asking each of our panelists what really motivated you to get involved in either international development or an organization like the World Bank or IFC. Which is a World Bank. Which is the World Bank. <laughs> Anybody want to start? Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. Um, there's actually two different answers to that. So <coughs> as an economics student here at GW, I got very interested in development issues. At the time, I actually was interested in just regional development, and I thought that that was urban and regional planning, and that's how I got started. So I went and got a master's in urban and regional planning and realized that actually isn't what I was interested in, that international development is what I wanted to do. Um, and so I got my PhD in international development and econometrics and all. But the way I got involved at the World Bank is I stumbled into the job. I was working somewhere else. Um, the bank bought some hardware and software from the company I was working for. I got sent to the bank to teach people how to use it. And after three weeks, they offered me a job. And quite honestly, at the time, I didn't know what the World Bank was. But everybody I knew told me to take the job. That's Okay. Shall I go next? Sure. Is this working? Yes. It is. Okay. So, um, what motivated me uh, to go into international development? Um, I worked 15 years in uh, what I call hardcore private sector companies, uh, in majority in developing markets. So, I worked in, you know, in Africa, Eastern Europe, Latin America, Middle East. Um, and then I started working in Western Europe because I thought that's a good thing you know, on your CV. You need to work on, you know, developed market and it was very boring. Um, and then I joined an engineering company. Uh, I'm an HR person. Eh? I've always worked in HR. Uh, I joined an engineering company. Um, and then one day I come home and try to explain to my daughter who was at the time seven, um, you know, what do I do? And it was very difficult to explain. Um, so I realized that actually I studied law and politics and I wanted to save the world and maybe uh, trying to cut uh, jobs and uh, cut the uh, bonuses uh, was not the best way to save the world. Um, IFC had contacted me a few years before and I had turned down the job because I thought it's not really interesting to work for the World Bank. Um, and interesting in, interestingly enough, I had a very good recruiter there because uh, during five years she called me three times a year just to know if I was still happy, if I liked what I did, and each time she offered me something and then I was not interested. And then one day where I was so miserable after that conversation with my daughter, she called me and she said, well, we have this job there, you know, are you interested now? And I said, well, maybe it's the right time for me to move. So um, it was the right mission, and for me, I see was the right combination between how do we you know, encourage private sector development in emerging markets, where I've worked most of my career. I strongly believe in that mandate. Um, it was a nice job, well paid. Washington, good experience for the kids, so I decided to move. And that was 18 months ago. So would you say that the, so IFC first contacted you five years before, or did you initially have contact? No, actually, I, I was contacted uh, by IFC to a headhunter, ah. um, and uh, I came, I, did, I was interviewed by 18 people in two days, oh my <laughs> <God>. <laughs> and then I turned down the job, and I will never <laughs> forget the director of HR then looked at me and said, you mean you're not going to join the World Bank group? And I said, yes, I'm not going to join the World Bank group. I guess that kind of triggered interest to him, and they contacted me for the next <laughs> five years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, that's how I joined. Great. That's a great story. Thank you. Roberto? My experience is responding to an advertisement by the World Bank on an Italian newspaper. There were probably 20 job titles, and the very last one was about recruitment. There were two lines, and I applied. I knew very little about the organization. I knew that I, w I had a strong interest in, in an international dimension of my experience. I was working in the private sector with executive searches in, uh, back in Italy. And um, what I, I knew little about the bank, and I didn't know that, of course, when they contacted me after several months, 
I, I was interviewed, and then other few months passed with very little communication. Then they contacted me again, and then I went through very something very similar with probably 16, 18 interviews in a couple of days for a one-year contract. And I was convinced, I was sure that it was my experience. So I tried very hard to keep my position with my consulting firm in Italy and say, you know, I'll be back, you know, next, next September, I'm here. Yeah. Say, yeah, no, go ahead, it's a good experience for you. And, uh, and they didn't know that, you know, there's also the possibility if you are, you know, lucky to, to be extended that you have maybe a longer contract later. But about development, because that was the question, I, I knew honestly very little uh, coming from, you know, private sector experience and, uh, and then a different environment. But now I'm, I think I'm pretty good in uh, promoting development and, and the work that we do. Thank you. Let me try a slightly different uh, approach for that. Um, I, I came to the bank because when I was uh, changing jobs, I was doing the normal procedure of networking, and I called somebody, a friend of mine, and she said, well, I don't know of anything, but a friend of mine who's working at the World Bank, they, he told me he's looking for, they're looking for people. And I called that person up, and he said, yes, we are looking for people in our group, but uh, I'm not the person you want to talk to. You want to talk to my boss. And he mentioned the person's name. It was an individual that I happen to have known 12 years earlier who did a consulting contract with me in a former life for both of ours um, and came in and, and I was offered a, a half year contract um, and which is a very familiar way that the bank operates is a, what we call a short term contract another short term and moves on from there in, in many instances. Uh, but I started out as a, as a career counselor in the bank and actually doing outplacement work when the bank was uh, at, at that time uh, letting a, a reasonably large number of people by our standards uh, go. And uh, a few years later, that same boss, who was a person I really came to appreciate, uh, said to me, I'd like you to take the lead on another project that we're interested in doing. And I said, well, I really like what I'm doing right now. And uh, she said, okay. And the next day she came back to me and said, I'd really like to take the lead on this new project we're being asked to do. And I said, but I really like my job now. And she says, okay. And she came back to me the next day, and she said, I'd really like you to take this job. I said, you really want me to do this job, don't you? And she said, yes. And I said, okay, you've not steered me wrong yet. And so I, I, I agreed to it. And for the next five years, I was the bank's key person in performance evaluation, which, if you know anything about performance evaluation organizations, is the person that everyone loves to hate, uh, and that was me. But at the end of that time, the uh, assistant vice president in HR uh, asked to see me and said, I think it's time for you to move on and, and rotate. Do you want to change jobs? And I said, no. And we went through the same rotation of, of three times. And I guess the, the message in this, and actually it happened just uh, nine months ago again, because the bank does move people around. Uh, the message in this is we sometimes think we know what we want to do, uh, but it's always a wise idea to listen to other people, uh, because sometimes they know even a little bit more than you do. Uh, and if you can kind of balance their perceptions with your interests and goals, it, it might prove to be a very positive situation for you. Thanks, Eric. That's a really nice segue into the next question about how people get hired into the World Bank, into the IFC, and what sort of a typical career path for the individuals. Who would like to start with this one? Well, since I have the mic, let me, let me start off by making it very easy for my colleagues to say there is no typical career path, I, I think. Uh, everybody does it differently, um, and I think what you're going to hear from uh, IBRD, or what we call the World Bank, and the IFC, and MEGA, uh, are three of the five organizations within the World Bank group, and for each of those organizations it's different, uh, and for others a, a, as well. Uh, so I think what you really want to do is, is be more concerned, not so what's a typical, but what would you be interested in, or collecting a variety of samples of information from a variety of people to understand those different perspectives. Uh, but as I said earlier on, for many individuals, coming into the World Bank starts off with a, a short-term engagement, uh, which may be for a day or a week or a month. Um, and, and here the, the critical notion is what you would be told in any organization, is do a good job. Because if you do a good job in that day, week, or month, uh, they may be interested in keeping you for another day, another week, another month, or another year, or longer. Uh, but if you decide not to do a good job, uh, there's an easy separation. So uh, I guess the notion is if you want to be someplace, you got to start off well and strong from the day one. Thank you. Bernie? I agree with you. And um, I think there is no typical career path, but I'd like to take one example. It's an example of uh, one of our 
very, very young senior manager who is probably going to become a director very soon. I'm not going to tell his name because otherwise he's going to be... I think he actually gives uh, teachers in GW now. So this is somebody who's today 39 years old. He started his career with IFC um, something like 17 years ago. And he was a short-term consultant in Mongolia. So, which is typically, if you know the, a little bit the, you know, the lingo of the bank, STC, we have a lot of STC, short-term consultant, um, uh, people don't like that, uh, but that's an interesting one because he started as a short-term consultant in Mongolia, which is in you know, the middle of nowhere for Washington, um, and then moved the ladder by working hard and doing the right thing and making some choices and taking some risks. And today he's what we call a global business line leader meaning that he, he runs one of our biggest you know, industry departments um, in IFC with a global outreach and with 200 people under him. I think that's a nice example of a, a very successful career path, but you know, you're right. You can decide <coughs> to enter the bank even on a, on a you know, very good contract and never move at all. So that's really depending on you know, what do you decide to do and how do you decide to move on and what risk are you ready to take. I've always wanted the chance to say this. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, unless you want me to talk about my atypical career path as being typical, I don't really have anything to okay. add. So. That's fine. Do you want me to or not? No. It's up to you. Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> Ditto. Okay. Robert, do you want to add anything to this? No, you might have an interesting career path link to what you were saying because I mean the possibility the bank would definitely offer to people with you know with the right motivation the possibility to work outside if you like their comfort zone yeah, uh, you, you might have you know a strong background technical background in a certain discipline so you are technically strong in what you are studying but we need people and we appreciate people when they are able to work outside their technical competence in terms of integrating with different areas. You need to adjust your language, your style, and you need to interact with people from other sectors. This is very easy to, to understand, you know, with a with basic example. If, if you are a, you know, a transport engineer at the World Bank, there's no doubt that you need to have a technical competence, but at the same time, you need to interact on a daily basis with people dealing with environmental issues, social issues, and with the civil society, with the government counterparts, and so on. So this is the, you know, the beauty also the, of the organization, if you like, because it will give you the opportunity to move also very rapidly and to, to have different experiences in different areas, geographically and thematically, if I may. And I think you are a very strong okay, example so of this. I'll, I'll do the two minute version of this then. So, as I said, I'd worked at this private company that sold some hardware and software to the bank, and, and actually my experience was a lot like Eric's. It's not just that I went and taught the class. My boss came and asked me if I would go teach the class, and I said no, and three days later he came back and he asked me again, and I said no, and three days later he told me I didn't have any choice, so I went and did it, and much to his chagrin, I came back three weeks later and said, well, they offered me a job, goodbye. <laughs> um, so so I, I came to the bank not really knowing what it was, um, did actually commodity forecasting work for a couple of years, uh, left that for an opportunity to do research in, in development issues for a couple of years, um, left that to work on India as a country economist for a few years, um, and finished my PhD right about at that time. And that was five, six years in the bank, and I actually had decided, okay, I've got the PhD, I've got some experience, I'm leaving the World Bank, it's time to go do something else. I bumped into somebody who I had worked with at that private company who was now at the World Bank as a manager, and I told him I was leaving. He said, no, no, you can't leave. I just lost the econometrician in my unit. I need you to come work for me. So I did. I worked for him for four years, and um, as a couple people alluded to, networking is important. During that time, I went twice a year to Paris to attend meetings at the OECD, <coughs> and uh, after a few years of that, they asked me if I wanted to come there and work for them. And so I took a leave of absence from the bank and went and worked as an economist in Paris, which is actually a pretty nice gig, if you can get it. Um, 
Then somebody from the bank came back and said, would you come back to the bank now? And this was kind of the first piece of my career change because he wanted me to move away from the technical side and start managing a team. So I took on a small team of people doing industrial country forecasting, which grew into a larger team of doing global forecasting, which grew into managing the entire forecast uh, team. And then came the big change, which was seven, almost eight years ago now, uh, when I was asked to come manage a communications group. And you know, all my background was in economics and econometrics and had never done anything really in communications. But by that time, I was enjoying management a lot. And I decided, OK, I'd actually rather be a manager than be an economist. Um, so I took the chance and um, loved it. It was great. It was a great job. And eight months ago, somebody who liked the work that I had done with the communication side came and said, you know, we sort of need the same thing with our IT team. Could you come and work for us on that? Sure. Love to. So my third change. Um, so that's kind of a typical career path, actually. Very atypical. I'd like to add something. Um, so in, my day job is to be an HR uh, person, and, and you know when I have time, uh, which is you know pretty much the rest of the day, I'm also in charge of diversity and inclusion for IFC. And I must say, I'm looking at this room, and I have hope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think. Um, the, 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 and, and maybe I'm talking only for IFC, but I think it's, it's true at the bank as well. Um, the world has changed, and, and even the bank is changing. And in the past, uh, well, you know, there's always been a diversity and inclusion program at the bank, but it's, it's kind of getting more and more traction. Just to give you an example, um, President Zelik made a very strong statement that he wants 50% of his workforce being women. You know, by I think the target is to have that by 31st of December 2012. I have to check the numbers, but we're not there yet. So I, I, it's a message that I want to give you. I look at you, and you know, it's an extremely diverse room. So that gives me a lot of hope. Uh, it's uh, uh, you know we have you know people from all ethnic origins. We have I guess people from all you know, nationalities. We have women. We have men. And I think that when you, when you plan your career, you also have to be very conscious of that. Um, and not that, you know, because you're, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a, my usual black, bad joke, but you know, it's not that you have to be a black woman with one leg uh, to, be, to have a career, but you have to be very conscious that, you know, in terms of, I heard a lot of the word different, different career path, different. You know, but your diversity brings something to the World Bank as well. Um, and you have to be extremely conscious of that. Now, it's not only about being black or white or women or men or Asian or you know Arabic ethnic. It's also having the experience of where you come from, and that's really something that can you know when you, you think about what could be a career path for me, you know you have to take that into consideration as well. Yeah, that's an excellent point, Bernie. Thank you. Um, in fact as an individual is considering, especially as you're looking at diversity and inclusion um, and looking at, you know, certainly this, there's just some incredible talent in this room, how would an individual network their way or get their foot in the door of the World Bank or of the IFC? And I know that that's a very difficult mm -hmm. question to answer, and I know, Roberto, you get that question actually quite a bit. But I think that's what a lot of people really want to know. What does it really take? What's going to set one individual apart from, from the masses? You want to start? So let's start. Wear a red suit. <laughs> well, first, when it's not easy, as you say. But first of all, uh, for the bank, but I would say for other yeah. international organizations, private sector, whatever. Nowadays, you cannot afford anymore to contact, to network, without knowing who's on the other side. So the main challenge from outside is to get familiar as more as you can with your target. Could be position, could be a, a unit that you don't know the name or name of a manager. So you need to, to do some homework, as, as, they, as they say, and read as more as you can of what the 
organization is doing, the unit, the department, your, your target. If the objective that we are talking about is to network in terms of you know, contacting people and to get more familiar. Uh, it's equally difficult if you are targeting a, a position or a program or if you are, as I'm saying, you know, targeting a, a specific unit and department. But it's very, it's very, very important that this will give you the comfort when it's time to write a, a cover letter or to tailor your CV or to, you know, to have an opportunity to, to meet somebody. It's very important that not only because you might talk their acronyms, this is maybe not too relevant, but it's important that you are familiar with the challenges and what's going on. And the other, way, the other point maybe when you contact people and focus on you, on not on what they can, uh, you know, uh, on what they can have available for you, but focus on what you can offer. If you need, you know, if you have a question to ask for a professional or career advice, that's good, but focus on you, what you are doing, what you are studying, what you are writing, and see if they, you know, can, if you can engage the contact in the discussion, because of course on the other side that they could be well in interest to, for them to consider you a contact as somebody to keep in the loop if something comes up in terms of also opportunities. You know, there's no need basically to ask for a, for a position or for a job or for, or for an opportunity, but focus more on the professional dimension of the contact and try to focus on what, on what you can offer. And maybe I'll stop here to from now. I, I would like to tell you what not to do. <laughs> yeah. Don't send us email every five minutes. <laughs> I don't think the, the trick is, and, and you know, I, I do sometimes you know, forums, uh, job forums, etc. Um, you know, bombarding the HR person with your CV is not always the most um, efficient way of getting into the door. Uh, and that's where I'm, I totally agree with Roberto. I think you, know, you, you have to have something to sell. So it's, it, it's interesting when you are, and, and you will see, you will learn it when you more do interviews, um, is that there is always a point during the interview where the conversation kind of switch, and the interviewer starts selling you the organization. That's when you're in, okay? But as long as you don't tell you know, the person in front of you, okay, why would I come and work for you? It's not about why would the, you know, let's see how good I am and please hire me. But why would I come and work for the World Bank? You know, what do you guys have to offer me? You know, um, and so that's really a, a critical moment where, where you, when you realize that, uh, that um, there's a switch. And then, at least for the IFC, something very particular, um, uh, because of the private sector nature of it. Um, what I always um, uh, recommend, especially to students, is make sure that you can prove that you have your, you've had your hands a little bit dirty. So if you want to support the development of private sector in emerging market, you should know what private sector means. You should know, what, you know what's a financial analyst you know, on your neck. You should know what, what is at stake you know, if I don't achieve my result. You know, so a couple of years experience in private sector companies, uh, preferably in developing markets, and the ability to put that on your CV and say that this is what I did in private sector and therefore you know, I am credible to actually go and support private sector development is really a key element, at least for the uh, IFC. Thank you. <coughs> okay, I'll offer a rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> um, just, just, um, that's more IFC, perhaps. Um, just from my view as a hiring manager, which is also different than an HR view, I actually like to get people fresh out of school lots of times because then I can teach them what I want them to do. <laughs> so to, there, there is just that angle. I recognize this other one too, but, but quite often, um, especially in communications, in economics, I don't want somebody coming in with the philosophy of how things have to get done already because I need them to be doing what we need to do. Let me take the, the happy compromise. Because <laughs> um, it's, it's quite interesting um, on three different points. Number one, we have a 
two vacancies right now, well, actually more than two, but two in particular in the in MEGA uh, for underwriters. And uh, these positions are vacant because a senior underwriter, which is a position above, a level above this one, and a lead underwriter, which is two levels above this one, have left the organization. And the manager said, I don't want experienced people. I want some fresh blood that I don't have to unlearn in them. I can train them my way. So that's, that's true. That's very real there. But the bank in general is a place that looks for people with a little bit, a little bit of experience uh, under their feet. Uh, and we typically say that a, a, a person coming in for an entry level uh, officer or specialist level position is going to have generally about five years of experience. Uh, not required always, budget sometimes, but generally that. So uh, the other thing that we've seen a lot. Sorry what I was saying. Uh, <laughs> what I've seen a lot is people who come into the bank and think they can just get in somewhere and they're going to grow within the bank. Like, just give me a, I'll do anything. You know, I'll, I'll clean out the bathrooms for you just to get a, a foot in the door. The bank is a reasonably hierarchical and certainly bureaucratic organization. And it's not that easy to cross over lines that are there. And so if an individual says, I'll come in and do you know, the, the photocopying for you because tomorrow I can get a job as a, as a senior leader, that's going to be a very difficult transition. And in fact, the people who are in those level positions that are largely support to others and who want to grow into other opportunities, the advice that I often give to them is, is get out of here for a while and get some different kind of experience so you can be seen in, in a different light. But the question that we were initially answering was about contacts and networking and we've all speaking about that to say you have to know something about us to, to make it worth our while because if you walk into a conversation with somebody and, and basically say I don't know anything about you you know can you offer me a job uh, it's a pretty easy answer no but if you start telling us a little bit about you as was suggested and how you can help us out because in the end, we don't really care what we're going to do for you. It's what you're going to do for us. So you need to know something about us. And, and it's really pretty easy to find out information about us. Uh, the web is certainly a resource that's very prevalent today. But the bank also has something called an information center at the corner of 18th and Pennsylvania Avenue. On the ground floor of one of our buildings is the bank's information center. And you can walk in there and look at books written by bank staff read project reports written by bank people, read research reports written by bank people, and get an idea about what we do, and also learn some of the names of people who are doing the stuff that might be of interest to you. You know, the transport engineer was, was mentioned earlier on. If you read a, a project report by a transport engineer and it's, you know, Mohammed uh, Smith, then at least you know somebody who's a transport engineer, Mohammed Smith. Right? That's something you didn't know before you walked in there. So it, gathering information is, is a lot easier than you might think it is. And certainly being here in Washington right next door to us makes it even easier. My assumption as well is that there are a number of faculty members here at, at GW, not just from the School of Business, by the way, who are consultants at the bank, which means that they probably drag along with them junior people to help out on a project. And that's ways to get in, to get known, to understand, and get some experience with us. So all those things are perhaps things to consider and, and to keep in mind. If I could just add one more thing. And first I have to say I'm embarrassed because I used to manage the public information centers and I should have thought of that. But, um, just to add one thing to it though. So you've made your contacts, you've networked, you've gone out and bought the new suit, new dress, You've got a meeting, somebody's contacted me or some other hiring manager, and you've got that meeting and you show up, make sure there's no mistakes in your resume. <laughs> because the minute I open up that resume and there are typos in it, we're done, okay? If you can't be careful knowing what you're coming into to try to find a job, then I can't trust you to be careful when you're doing the job. So just have your friends double check it, have your parents double check it, get fresh eyes on it before you go out there with it. Great, thank you. Does anybody want to give any final tips on how do you actually network your way into the bank or IFC since it's very, very difficult to get anybody to respond to you and the <laughs> bank staff are extremely busy and we all know that. 
and that's just sort of the way it works. Yet at the same time, if you want to get a consulting position, most of those are not advertised, and you do need to know somebody inside. Yeah. So how can some of these people start to get to know or start to figure out how to make some of those linkages? I think Eric gave, gave some excellent ideas as far as connecting with some of the, the professors here at the university. Any other tips you want to throw in there? I'd like to emphasize the point that you just made. It's just practical. Uh, it's Let's get the microphone point up to you. The job. Jo every single job at the bank is now advertised in the external website. But for, for what we call term positions, staff positions, but consulting jobs, you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. And most of the consulting jobs, we have a link for consulting opportunities that you can click there. And probably today there are 10, 15 consulting opportunities, but the reality is that there are many more consulting opportunities because we operate differently at the HR level. So for consulting opportunities, uh, everything is handled by the hiring department and that advertising is just one of the options. They can also identify consultants through different ways. And again, we go back to networking. And I fu fully agree with all the suggestions that uh, Eric was uh, making a, about you know the, the of course the website and the, and the information center, but you know you also be creative about networking. But the main point, uh, so and you are in a much better position than a lot of other people that we usually meet for outreach because you are here. And uh, first of all, you need to think about your current network of contacts at the academia level, but also, uh, you know, your social. And if you think carefully, you might have already some contacts that they can, might bring you to people in your field of interest. And think of your field of interest. Don't think mm -hmm. of human resources, but really focus more on what you can, again, I think I'm repeating myself on what, on what you can offer. And the cover letter, if you do, a, you know, if you need to, attach your resume because uh, at the end it's always good to, to attach your resume to your message, to your email. You know, a, a short cover letter in two paragraphs where you really say, you know, this is what, I know you guys are doing this, this is what I can offer. Or even better, this is what I'm doing and what I've done in this context. Very clear. You know, if it's a position, you can emphasize something that is relevant vis-a-vis -vis the key selection criteria that you identify in the position description. If it's just a networking contact, you know, of course, again, focus on what they do and what you know they do and what you can offer in that context. And I was gonna just add, too, that this gets back to, in previous seminars that we talked about, the, the 10 ways to use the World Bank database strategically. You know, you can find out a lot about the projects. You can find out who's running the projects. You can find out who's doing what and where. So you can make those connections that Roberto is talking about. You can connect your background, your experience, your studies to what their needs are and let them know what you have to offer. Okay. I think what Roberto said about the stay focused is really critical. And, and you know, what you said, don't apply to just everything because uh, Believe it or not, but we kind of know who these people are, you know, and they automatically put aside. I mean, you have, you know, I have a list of names that are people who apply just to any position. I mean, I, we just don't look at these CVs, and they, you know, it, it's they're known. So just don't do that. Stay very focused on, um, you know, this is what I want to do because this is what I can do. This is stay very focused and 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 make it very short and to the point because. I think that by, I don't know what the numbers are, but by application, when, you, when we issue a job, I think in t 48 hours, we have 300 <coughs> applicants. You know, so you know, reading a long cover letter is probably not going to happen. So make it short, make it to the point, and you know, strategically, the way you write your CV, make it very visible. Thank you. Any other tips you want to add? Just, just a, a kind of a, a reality check on this is in conversations I've had with individuals in the past when I talk to them about an idea of networking or, or something like this they they, they get rather uh, self uh, concerned and say well but you know I, I don't have everything to be the the senior manager and I said that's good because we're not recruiting a senior manager 
I think it's to put to, to look at yourself in the reality of, of who you are and where you are, um, and, and what you have to <coughs> offer. We, we spoke about being specific about what it is that you that you are, but it's also to recognize what you're not. But but the things that you're not, you're not going after anyway. So you can walk around and, and get a pretty long list of things you can't do, but unless I ask you that question of what can't you do, you don't have a really good reason to volunteer that to me. So like just be natural. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I've just seen too many people get into this almost self-defeatist mode is, well, I know you're, uh, that the program that you're recruiting for has 12,000 applications and, and you only hire 30 people a year and, and wow, it's like, yeah, but 30 people get hired uh, and you only need one offer. Uh, it, it's just trying to be a little bit realistic about things for yourselves and it, it's very easy to, to see on the, on the negative side of things, but each of us in, in our lines of work uh, have been well trained to smell blood, uh, and and that's what they talk about sharks, right? All right. So, if if we smell blood, it's not going to help you. And, and what I mean by that is understand your skills, your abilities, place yourself well, go after things that are that are meaningful. And as Ron said, don't just throw to everything, but things that are meaningful and related to what you are about, and that makes sense to you. And if if you see something that's not for you. It, it, just to throw your hat in the ring is, is not the approach to take. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's a very detrimental approach to be taken. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Let's um, move a little bit over to some of the similarities and some of the differences between World Bank, IFC, and some of the other multilaterals. Does anybody want to talk about that, what you see are some of the major similarities and differences between roles, functions, jobs, etc.? Well, you certainly worked at OECD, Bob. Do you want to talk about some of the similarities and differences there? Um, okay, it was in the early 1990s. <laughs> <laughs> I was a lot younger than I am now. I was uh, born. And, and the OECD's in Paris, which is really the big difference. Um, you know, I don't know that there were any differences, really. Um, I mean, certainly the, in terms of diversity, there's a big difference between the World Bank and the OECD because to work at the OECD, you have to be from one of the OECD countries. Um, and at that time, there were only 24 OECD countries. There's more now, it's more diversity. Um, but in terms of the type of organization and the type of people who are attracted to it, very much the same. People who are interested in development, people who are interested in helping other people, um, a lot of people who like to go into their own room, their own office, and do mathematical equations. Um, I don't really have much more on, on similarities and differences. That's okay. And I've only, other than that, I've only been in the bank, so I don't know how other places differ. Well, I, I haven't been in different multilaterals. I, I can only compare, um, I think, some differences and some similarities between IPRT and IFC. So um, in IFC, um, I think one of the major difference uh, is that today, at least I know since I joined, we major in majority hire outside Washington. So we do not hire, or we, it's very, it becomes extremely tricky to get a job in Washington, okay? So we have a mode of, um, we're into a, a heavy decentralization type of model. So the, the, the majority of the hiring for us has been done for people willing to work in the field, not in Washington. So it doesn't mean that you cannot be hired from Washington, so you can you know, go here, but if you go and say, I want to work in Washington, it's going to be tricky. The, the chances for you to get a job in Washington and IFC today is almost close to zero. Okay, let's be very clear. Mm -hmm. So um, I know when Sandy you know, approached me, I said, well, I have no jobs in Washington, <laughs> you know? But that's the truth. Um, we don't hire in Washington. So that can be one of the major difference. Uh, as I said, we're looking for, we are actually looking more for mid-career type of people. I mean, there are, um, uh, uh, you know, YP programs, but the, again, it's very limited, and guess what? It's not in Washington. Um, so our, our YP program that we call GTT, Global Transaction Team, thank you, um, is a program where you rotate, and you actually rotate from region to region. And eventually, one, you, know, you can have one of the assignments in Washington, but it's really, that's, I think, a, a big difference because it has been extremely deliberate in the IFC uh, organization. 
You know, Veronique, given your interesting background about having worked primarily in the private sector, how would you say there are some similarities and differences between the IFC and the private sector? Um, in, in the way we work or in the way we hire? I would say like the types of roles, the job functions. Okay. So the, the, the in yeah. IFC, I think it's fairly straightforward, like at the IBRD. The typical jobs um, are what we call investment officers. So these are the people that you will find in Barclays Bank, in, you know, in uh, Citibank, in all these uh, commercial banks, but with an interest for development. Um, because you know, when the financial crisis happened, you know, everybody thought, okay, Lehman Brothers have gone down, so we're going to have all these investment officers, but they're not all interested in you know, doing development. So we're looking for people who have the technical skills of an investment officer, but with a very strong interest in, in development. And then, so that's one part of IFC. The second part of IFC um, that I actually had, uh, which is called advisory services, is looking more for people who are specialized and, and the hot jobs for the moment are climate change, climate change, and climate change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are the really, and uh, we're looking for specialist people, uh, at the base of the pyramid, so more into this consultancy type of uh, um, profiles, so strong project management, kind of skills, highly technical, uh, with a global experience. Um, so it's, it's very typical to that type of industry. So consultancy and investment bank, and the combination of both is even better. Excellent. How about on the IBRD and the MEGA side? What are sort of the hot job opportunities and careers that are coming up? Well, for, for MEGA, very similar in one regard to the IFC, which is we are also private sector oriented. Uh, MEGA is in, involved in political risk insurance to uh, allow foreign direct investment in developing countries. So the, the largest segment of, of the MEGA population are, are underwriters. And uh, I just did a quick tally here, and, and in the last uh, nine months, uh, we have either hired or will be hiring uh, six underwriters uh, to our team. Now that may seem small or large, but MEGA as an agency is only 100 people, and there are only about 40 of them who are in the operations group, so that's six out of 40. That's a pretty large percentage. Uh, but the people we're looking for there are, again, individuals who, like you in many ways, you know, have a, a business background, can do you know, financial work and quantitative analysis quickly, et cetera, have an entrepreneurial spirit, uh, but want to apply that in the developing world, clearly, uh, and have an interest in and can understand what political risk means. And so we can do you know, risk assessments on the political side, not just on the business side of things. Uh, so that's kind of the, the, the normalcy for, for us and, and what we're looking at. But <clears throat> back to the, the more broad question in terms of what are the differences between other organizations. I've, I've had some opportunity to do con some consulting and, and cross work when I was at the bank with some UN agencies in, in Geneva, uh, the UNHCR, UN High Commissioner for Refugees, and the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria and also World Health Organization. The work I was doing then was on performance management, but here's the quick story. Uh, I was using some case studies of problems that we've used in the, in the bank, and as I presented it to them, they said, how long have you been working with us? And I said, oh, I just came in you know, the day before yesterday, and they said, and you've been able to figure out all of our problems this quickly? Uh, because the cases that we have at the bank are the same cases that they have. I mean, people are people are people. Uh, so there's probably a lot more similarities than one would say differences. But the, the difference that does exist between organizations like the World Bank Group and the private sector, there is some starkness there. I mean, if you want to make a lot of money, don't come to the World Bank Group. We pay well, but we're not going to give you the highest salary. We, we don't have, outside of some small programs in IFC, we don't have bonus programs. You know, so it's not based on the profit, you're going to get more. Right? People who come to the World Bank Group come because of the mission of the organization. We fight poverty with a passion. And we, and we talk about a world free of poverty. Uh, and, and that's what drives people to come to, to work every day. Thank you. Any other thoughts or input on what are sort of the hot careers? And any, Roberto, what are sort of the upcoming types of jobs that World Bank might be looking for? Yes. Uh, before answering this, I would like to mention something that I think is 
maybe not unique, but special about the bank. And I think it's very difficult to, to find the job opportunity at the bank, but at least what I'm going to say is it's very positive. The, whatever we do as a, as a World Bank group, we do it with partners, you know, projects, programs, initiatives, whatever we do, we do it with different partners. So that's quite unique about the organization. We work with government, we work with private sector, with academia, with the different players in development. So what does it mean in, in recruitment terms? <coughs> that we probably hire from different partners and people after an experience of bank can go more or less everywhere. And, and so this is very important to, to understand. It's also that you can join the organization as a young professional, but you can also join the organization after 10 years of, of experience that could be relevant for development. So this is very important to understand. That, uh, and I think this is also different compared to other organizations also in the development arena. They don't have the same approach vis-a-vis -vis the private sector or other players, including the civil society. Maybe. So, th so that's important. In terms of, you know, Jobs, uh, if you know very briefly, you know, we operate in six different regions and uh, uh, let's say four major networks, major areas. And uh, of course, these are all equally important. So we have one that is called human development, where, where you have health, education, and social protection. Then you have the sustainable development network, where you have all the infrastructure, transport, urban, water, energy, but also you have rural development and environment. Then you have <coughs> the PREM network, poverty reduction economic management, where you have people with a background in economics, but also people focusing on gender and, and uh, governance issues. And then the fourth network, the finance and private sector development network, where we interact a lot with IFC, and we have all the activities focusing on finance and private sector. These are all equally important. Nowadays, definitely, if I see about you know what the main challenges and maybe the main opportunities are, I would definitely say the fragile states mm -hmm. uh, areas and the disaster management. You see there are a lot going on, and uh, also in terms of opportunities. And uh, connected to this infrastructure and all that traditional has been very strong in the organization. So everything related to urban development, transport, energy, water, telecommunication, very, very important. Governance, climate change, these are the areas where uh, I guess in terms of, you know, at least quantity of opportunities, we might have more openings now in the near future in the context of what you highlighted of decentralization. There's no doubt uh, maybe not with the same speed and the same format of IFC, but there's no doubt that the World Bank of tomorrow will be more and more uh, outside no. Washington, more global, and more uh, close to the countries that we try to help. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, I think um, you've all heard enough questions from me. Why don't we open it up to the group here and hear some of your questions. Who'd like to start? Yes. So whenever I'm interested in a project, what I do is I go to the website and, and there's a name of the project manager there, so I try to contact that person. But that's not the same in the case of IFC. Do I get some project information? I do not know who's the project manager, so I, I don't have anyone to contact. What would be the best way to find out who's managing the project I would be interested in? Okay, so uh, probably the reason why the name is not there is prob is most pro is if it is a project, it's it's because it's in the field, and therefore the project manager would be in the field. So that that would be the explanation. Um, I have never looked at the differences there. What would be the best way to? Um, um, I think on if you go on the website, there is an organization. Um, uh, there is an organization chart which is updated. Um, on a regular basis. One of the ways to actually uh, get to know who is the project manager is to contact uh, even the global or the director or the manager person and, and explain why you would be interested. Um, the other, the alternative is then to contact HR 
Uh, <laughs> but I say it's the alternative. <laughs> Bernie, I'm not you offering your phone number? I'm not responding to the emails. <laughs> I'm thinking about my colleagues. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, who would like to take that one? Bob. Okay. Um, well, first let me say that for me and in the jobs I'm in, some of them I'm really looking for technical expertise, but I'll also tell you a story about how I hire people besides that. So where I am now working with IT, obviously if I need a Lotus Notes program or an SAP programmer, the technical expertise has to be there, and all I really care about is how good they are at doing, not all I care about, but they have to be really good at doing that. But I have also hired people into jobs where I've met them, talked to them for a long time, realized there's really something special about the person, and I can teach them the technical side. If we're talking about a job in communications, even some of the jobs in economics, um, some of the, you know, the, the IT part there, there is the IT specialization, but an awful lot of it is, is running a business. And for the most part, the IT specialists, the programmers and engineers, don't know how to run a business. And so I will take somebody who I just think is very special, and I'll train them how to run a business. So the technical expertise can work both ways. Um, in terms of how to get <coughs> the technical expertise, um, the education is important. Um, the experience that I said before I didn't care as much about, but Eric does, um, is certainly important. But it, it really depends a lot on the job and, and whether or not that expertise is the most important thing or whether I need somebody who is hardworking, very intelligent, fits in well with the group and, and all the other intangibles that, that go along with it. Anybody else want to address that one? Eric? Yeah, just real quickly, uh, you know, I, I think education is good, necessary, but but not sufficient. Um, and you probably heard that from a lot of people around the university telling you, you know, get out and get something. And, and some of you might say, you know, but how can I get something if I don't have something? And, you know, that, that typical catch-22. Um, and I'd say, well, look what you already have. I mean, you know, experiences are built in many places, not just the paid work world. Uh, the, the projects that you do as part of your MBA program, uh, are experiential, uh, and, and you can sell those to to me or anybody else as as, as real world experience. If in fact it was, uh, I mean, don't don't make a pack of lies to us. But if if you were really working on a project with a real organization and, and doing something for them, that's real experience, uh, and I think it's important. But what you heard Bob say, I think what all of us also look at is, is there has to be the balance between the the, the technical side of things uh, and, and then the, the the people skills, the interpersonal, and the leadership, and the team communication, whatever terms you want to use for it. The, the, some people use the word softer side. Uh, I personally, the more important side. Uh, but it's the side that really makes the differentiation. Uh, and, and you're going to see that, our eyes are going to see that in terms of the, the kinds of places that you've worked. Uh, and, and if there's enough to catch some interest then through through an interview. Uh, but but we, we all make some generalizations. I mean, just mean, tell me very quickly. We were looking at one person to come into our organization in a support level capacity. And, and the person had uh, been out of the work world for a, a long period of time and, and has been working from home, uh, doing some rather constructive things. But the, the job that we need this person to do is to respond really quickly to a lot of pressures that have come from multiple people all at the same time. And we couldn't see that from a person who works from home and, and, and kind of does one thing for a, a long time. So it, again, it's back to my old, earlier statement: is you know, sell us on what matches to our need, and, and don't be upset if what you, you know, what you have is not what we want, or what you want is not what we have. Uh, it has to be a match from both sides. Thank you. Yes. Um, Mrs. Cabal, you talked a little bit about uh, the decentralization that is occurring. 
uh, within the IFC. Dr. Kenny Ross has talked about the, um, the fact that we would actually like to sometimes find people without that much experience and, and want them to essentially be the, be the worker that you want them to be. So kind of combining those two things, do you think that with this, I guess I have a two-part question. With this decentralization, do you find that it's occurring in other parts of the world that are apart from the IFC, such as MIGA, and, and also with this new decentralization, I imagine moving from a centralized to a decentralized organization, will be there will be a start hiring. And would you say that you know for someone that's graduating that has relevant internship experience and whatnot, but doesn't have an advanced degree because they just graduated from UVA, is there positions, you know, for or is there like a trend in, in, the, in the culture to move towards, you know, trying to look for people that that can be molded as well and not just, you know, have have advanced degrees and, and career experience. So, Long question, I know. That's a very long question. <laughs> <laughs> and it's after five, you know. <laughs> um, okay, I, I'm not sure I understand all your question, but what I understand is your question is, is your question um, with a decentralized model, looking at more people with experience, is there still positions for people with less experience? With the new trend in decentralization. Well, I yes. Um, <coughs> But again, it depends what you want. We, we started the conversation by career, right? <coughs> so I, I think, you know, when it depends what you want to do with your career. You know, if you want to enter into a, you know, despite your degrees, et cetera, into a support position, you know, you will always, you know, you can find a place. Um, but longer term, is that what you really want? Um, and, and, and as I said, I mean, you know, Sandy knows it. I, I, was, I didn't want to come because I said I, I have no jobs or any of them, you know. It's, it's basically true. Um, in terms of, and I think you, you made the distinction. You can enter as a staff, you know, which is a post, you know, then you have the benefits and all the, the nice things that goes with it. Or you can enter as a consultant. I think for, for somebody with a bit less experience and who is not ready to move to tomorrow, uh, to the field, uh, entering IFC as a consultant is a very good way of entering because it gives you IFC on your CV, uh, it gives you the network that, you know, that nobody else can give you, uh, it gives you a real experience. But then you have to be very conscious about the fact that it's a short term <coughs> consulting. Um, so uh, you need really to plan that you, know, you don't want to be 10 years a short-term consultant. And, and I say that because I, I met people who have uh, been short-term consultant for more than 10 years. And then complain, well, you know, it's a choice that you have to make. So it's a good way. Short-term consulting is really a good way to enter in the organization. I think what you said about working with partners, we work a lot with partners, is also a very good way to, uh, because it's kind of you work with, uh, with us but you keep a feet outside, so which, which is also a good way of networking, etc. A staff position, I'm not going to lie, it's, it's really hard. It's very, very hard to find a staff position if in IFC, if you're not mid-career, you know, and strong experience and expertise. It's very hard, it's almost impossible. Thanks. Um, yes. Well, I just had a question uh, going on to the question about <laughs> <laughs> making career transitions. Um, are there other places that the World Bank for people who are making career transitions work experience with different things like engineering, for example? Mm -hmm. Can you probably like, talk about maybe some of those uh, career experiences that you've seen for other people or career transitions that other people have made that you know? Well, I, I we are a pretty conservative organization. Okay, so I think, you know, it's not that common that you transition. However, what I've heard uh, many times uh, now, more and more from directors, um, especially in the investment side of our business, is that they say, well, you know, at the end of the day, one of the reasons why IFC is known is that we're really good at structuring deals. We're really good at that. And we actually trade, you know, you can be an investment banker from Citibank, you will learn from scratch again how to structure a deal because there is an IFC way of doing it. So he was saying to me, I would be interested of having an urbanist or an engineer or um, somebody with, who has absolutely no investment experience because the investment, structuring the deal, I can teach that. You know, I can teach that. That's not rocket science. Everybody does it and we can teach that. Or a lawyer, a lawyer can become a very good you know, investment officer. So there is more and more you know, opening about that. 
But again, it's, it, we're at the beginning. We, we're pretty conservative, I think. Can I go back to the previous question for one sure. second? Just throw sure something out there. <laughs> Just yeah. on, on the experience question again. Um, if I'm hiring, well, my boss just got hired last July. She's the World Bank Group CIO. And she had 18 years of experience as a CIO on Wall Street. And they weren't going to hire somebody without that kind of experience. But if what we're talking about is a job for an entry level position or somebody with a couple of years experience, then I want somebody who is entry level or has just a couple of years experience. You're not applying for jobs that need 15 years experience. And if it's an entry level job, I don't want somebody with 15 years experience to take that job because they'll be bored and they're just there to look for their next job anyway. So I wouldn't worry so much about that. You guys have the experience that coincides with the jobs that you're trying to look for. Now, that being said, if you're applying for an entry level job, and you had a summer job or a job between your BA and, and your MBA or whatever that's in the particular field that you're applying for, so much the better. If you had any job during that time or a job during college or something, that's, that's good. The only thing I really wouldn't want to see is you're coming to me for the first job you've ever held. Okay, I want to know you've been in the workforce before. That's, that really is probably the most important thing at, at this level. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, I have a question about the, the young professionals program, particularly who it targets. The, the, the official span of years is, is rather broad, but I was wondering if you would consider this a program worth pursuing if you already have, say, five or six years of experience, or if it is more something targeting very recent graduates? Well, in, in the IFC, the GTT program, definitely. If you have five years experience, in a, in, you know, definitely it's a good way. It, I would target it, yeah. YP? Uh, uh, the YP at the bank, you know, there's an age limit of 32. Yes, um, also, yeah. same. And uh, it's the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> Basically, with the age limit of 32, the more the better in terms of experience that you can bring. The competition is probably, we know, statistically that you are a competitive YP when you are 30, 31 or close to the, to the age limit. And we know that again, uh, you need at least uh, three years of experience on top of your strong academic credentials. If you have four, you have five, you have maybe you are even more competitive. Uh, we have another program that, uh, you know, the, the YP at the bank is basically the leadership program. It's the opportunity for the bank to identify and target the best talents, you know, diverse uh, talents worldwide that are able, you know, to grow rapidly in, in the organization. But then we have another program that is called Junior Professional Associate mm -hmm. with a totally different target and spirit with an age limit of 28. And this is targeted people with no experience, basically, but people with you know, on the right track in terms of motivation, passion for development, and also from the academic point of view, but no professional experience. Maybe if they've done internships, uh, maybe they've done something, but no professional experience. People that maybe with two years at the bank as junior professional associate are able to, to continue to develop a career on something they like to do, development, and to be engaged on development matters. So that's, these are different targets. These are really for people with no experience. And the JPA, just for clarification, is that program that's two years and then you have to leave the bank. You can't stay there beyond those two years. But you could go back to the bank Absolutely. later on. Absolutely. But you they can do actually apply right away for the young professional program with no interruption, no gap. Otherwise, you need to leave for two years, continue your study to have more experience, and come back after two years. And, and I think uh, MEGA has just recently inaugurated our own program called the, the MEGA Professionals Program. Uh, and this is one that uh, we don't have s the same sort of specific age when we're saying maybe 32, 35, we're a little fuzzier about it. Uh, but it is for, for individuals who are reasonably new in, in the workplace, 
Uh, but also we're looking for people with, with you know, three to five, four, five, six years of experience. The candidates that we're interviewing now uh, each have five plus years of experience. Uh, so again, the, the, the more the better in, in that regard. I, I wouldn't uh, take it away. But I, I think the, the point that Bob made earlier on was, is exactly that. It, it's targeting what you're about. And it's not looking for jobs that's, that's not in your background, that you don't have the qualifications for. And so it's making that realistic connection that I think is, is such an important element to it. Okay. Tom, you had a question earlier. Yeah. Actually, uh, I think you're hearing, uh, <coughs> Very international exposure for us means that you've actually worked uh, in more than one country, preferably in more than you know, one region. So that's what we mean by international exposure. Is that you no? Know, I think that's pretty straightforward. In terms of mobility, I think that's a little bit of a tricky one. It's a nice subject at the bank for the moment. Um, but just to give you an idea, um, I had data <coughs> this week about. Uh, the level of uh, the number of people who are on mobility packages uh, in IFC, and we are at about 20%, um, which is huge. Okay, it's really a lot, um, and to go, it's going uh, across the professional you know, grade F and above. Sorry for the lingo, but uh, that's professional and above. So it, it's pretty huge. You have two types of mobility: either you are on uh, what we call developmental assignment, which is really you know, you go for a year, maybe two, and you come back. And the idea is that you can transfer your skills and acquire new skills. So this is very open, it's very <coughs> much used because it's, it has proven to increase the exposure of international. Or you, you actually move uh, for a longer period of time on a real, uh, you know, to do a real job, if you will. Um, but that you have to be a little bit more senior because it's expensive. So that gives you an idea. Thank you. How about the bank side? Well, the, the bank, when we talk, it's not, no different. When we talk about international experience, it's feet on the ground. Uh, you know, there, there are people I've, I've met who said, well, I, I studied abroad, and I say that's very good. Uh, but that doesn't make it. You know, I, I vacationed, you know, in the Caribbean. You know, that's very nice, but yeah. that's not what it is. Um, but so it's feet <laughs> on the ground doing the kind of work that, that's being done. Uh, but it, that can be with you know Peace Corps type organizations, Catholic charities, you know the, the Red Cross, Red Crescent societies. It, it's getting that exposure in in the developing world, which is, is so important. And in terms of mobility, uh, the bank wants to see people moving around because uh, the bank is is really two banks together. It's a, it's a lending bank where there's money involved, and it's a knowledge bank which is bringing expertise and knowledge to our to our clients. And, and so the bank has a program, a uh, concept actually, to say people need to be moving around. And, and we, we, we use an expression 357. And what that means is, you know, we expect you to stay in a job for three years so you can learn it and, and kind of have a return on investment that's being made in you. And at, at five years in that job, you better start thinking about where you're going to go to next. And at seven years, we may help you move. Uh, and and I, I'm, you know, a, a, a beneficiary of, of seven years because it was at seven years for me in those two times I moved where my boss came to me and said, as much as I am going to hate this to happen, you need to leave this unit and you need to go someplace else and take your knowledge and experience to that other place and, and continue to learn in that other place. And that's the same thing we do for, for everybody else. Uh, you heard Bob's story about moving around. It's exactly that. It's the value that we have to our clients is that we bring to them that global knowledge and experience. We're, we're not a regional bank or a bilateral organization. It's the World Bank, and it's that for a reason. Thank you. 
And to also place that in the bigger context of multilaterals, I know some of the UN agencies are mandating mobility as well. Five years and you're moving on. Can I, can I just add mm -hmm. to this? Because I, again, I want to come back to that experience thing again, because you refer to the, the F level professional entry. So that's somebody with a graduate degree and five, seven years, what is it? Five years of experience. Now, some of you in the room may have that already. But if you're just getting your degree and you've got a year or two or summers or whatever, again, great if you have international experience, but that's not necessarily what we're looking for at this level. At the higher level, if you've been out in the workforce five or seven years, certainly yes, that really brings a lot of something. But if you've been basically in school and held a couple of jobs, you know, it's, it's just not quite that important at this level. Okay. I just had a question. If there are any IT projects within the uh, within the World Bank or external external projects, you know, maybe in the field that have you know relation between IT and finance and how those you know they, um, different fields massage each other and how you know student any student here with such a background would be able to employ those um, the skills or his other skills. Okay. Um this I'm sorry? That question might need to be repeated for the folks back here. Oh, oh did you all hear the question? Okay. okay. The question was, okay. is how does finance fit in with IT, and how do they have some sort of a symbiotic relationship, as well as how does sort of finance fit in with any of those exactly. types of career fields? Exactly. Within, within the World Bank and outside of the World Bank, and what's with maybe in the field of any other country. Okay. Um, there's three parts to that answer, actually. Um, so first, within the IT unit that I work, which is actually <laughs> the chief information officer, is the finance complex of the World Bank. Um, and so the, the finance complex has its own vice president, but it also reports to the chief information officer. And so IT, people with MBAs and all are very tied in to that area. Now, this reporting line like that is actually just a month or so old at this point, so I don't know a lot about the finance complex, but, th but that's one of the linkages. The second one, um, which I alluded to earlier a little bit, is that within the IT world, we need people who know finance and how to run projects and run businesses because the IT engineers don't know how to do that. So there's a, a clear tie in there. And the third, and again, this is an area we're just starting to get into now, um, is what we call ICT, which stands for something communications and technology. International. <laughs> <laughs> okay, information, thank you. Sure. Um, which is basically the application of technology within the projects mm. that the bank does. So, you know, we're, we're looking at things like could every farmer in India be carrying uh, an iPhone with a special sensor you can put into the ground and get a reading that gets beamed up to somewhere by satellite, you know, and they come back and they find out the acidity of their soil instantaneously and all this sort of stuff. So there is a lot of that. It's not currently with our part of the bank, and it's actually done more in IFC than, than with us. Um, so I don't know a lot, but I can maybe get you in touch with some people on that one. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Yes. I'm almost afraid to answer that question. <laughs> um, I, I'll give you an example. I joined uh, was, uh, the, World, uh, the World Bank on a two years contract. I, I'm on a G4 visa. <coughs> and frankly, I was not worried at all. Again, maybe because I have a different experience. For me, it was actually the first time in my life that a company said, you have a two years job. Right? I mean, I never had that level of stability before, ever. 
Okay, because I come from a world where every morning you can have a letter and say that says you have 15 minutes to clear your desk. So I think you know. So my way of approaching it, but I, I, and, and I must admit, uh, and I said that to Sandy as well, I'm not a benchmark, right? <laughs> but my way of approach is to give people a reality check, okay? Um, I'm not worried, my contract got renewed, maybe I've done something good, you know? Um, so I think if you, if it, it, it's a mindset for me. If you come in and say, I only have a you know, two years contract, oh my God, then you know you focus more on the wrong thing. So if uh, I think you you said Bob as well, you know, be good at what you do, and people will pick you up. And if it's not the bank, they make a big mistake. Somebody else will, right? So that's the way I deal with it. Now, um, is it the the best uh, employment framework? Frankly, it's uh, it's you know given the entire how the entire planet works for the moment, I think it's extremely comfortable. Uh, but again, I come with a very different experience of that. Um, I think when you're a student, I said that actually to one of our you know, very young professional in IFC who was asking me, but I'm on a term contract, how can I become an open-ended contract? You know, which is a big debate at the bank as well. And I said, well, I hope that if you're 28, you know, your young woman from part two country is such a brilliant mind, your goal in life is not to become open-ended. You, know, you should have <coughs> different objectives in that. Is it the most stable organization? I think. Personally, for what I've seen, yes, it is. It's a very stable organization. If you're good at it, you know, we talk about performance management, people will pick you up. Yeah, by the way, my first job, I started my first HR job in Anderson Consulting on a three weeks contract. <laughs> and, and, you know, and they kept me for one year and I resigned. So you, know, it, you have to change your mindset a little bit about that. We're actually just about out of time, so I'm sorry we can't get to everybody's questions. We will have hopefully a little bit of time if the panelists are willing to stick around during the reception. But I thought maybe one way to sort of wrap this up is that if each of you would be willing to sort of share your best advice for MBAs who would be interested in getting into international development, whether it's the World Bank, IFC, or any other sort of international organization. Maybe your 30 to 60 second advice bit. Roberto, do you want to start? use my 30 seconds to share with you one or two more networking tips uh, instead of uh, another advice that I, m I meant to mention earlier but I forgot about it. Um, using the website of the World Bank to pull out names, ideas and contacts, don't forget that when, when you go on the different, first of all you need to remember because of the metric structure you have people of interest in the regions and the sectors. So you need to, to do a good research in that respect. Some of the website pages, you will see you can subscribe to newsletters. You probably have already done that. That's a very good way to be in contact, to know what's going on, especially because you are local. You know, maybe there are also initiatives or something that, you can attend and participate. Anyway, it's a good way to know what's going on and, and you can reflect this when it's time to write and contact and call people. And, and another thing I want to mention, also on the job posting, you can apply for email alert. You can select the sector of interest and you will be informed every time there's a position of interest in, your, in that sector. So even if it's a job, uh, it's a very good thing, because even if it's a job that requires 20 years of experience, it's very important that you are familiar with the selection criteria and the duties and responsibilities. Again, to understand what we are looking for, but also to you know, highlight what is more relevant of your pre previous <coughs> experience or what you are doing and so on. Thank you. Thank you. My 30 seconds. Um, be passionate <coughs> about what you do, be the best at what you do, believe in yourself, be innovative, be an entrepreneur, and maybe I hope that in a few years I will be the one calling you three times and telling you really need to come and do <laughs> this job. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you, Veron. So for the second time tonight, I can say ditto. <laughs> that, was, that was very good advice. Um, I'll use my time to tell you a little personal story to finish up that whole career piece. Um, about a year ago, uh, the external affairs department at the bank where I was working at the time took a huge budget cut and they decided to eliminate 
pretty much most of the management level. And I was one of the people whose jobs got eliminated. And I spent the first month or two kind of in a panic applying for every job that I could think of at the bank. Um, not really very interested in any of them, just, just wanted to stay. And there was one weekend where I had a sort of epiphany and realized, you know, this is the time I can get on with my life and do what I really want to do. Eric got me hooked up at the Career Center, so I started my counseling work there because of that, um, because that's something I've always wanted to do. Um, and it, I realized then I really didn't want to work somewhere just for the sake of having a job and doing something. And it's really important to do something that you want to do. It's also really important to take risks. So what happened was, because I'd had all these years of experience and kind of a friendly guy, people around the bank, some people heard that I had made the decision to leave and all of a sudden I'm getting phone calls, you're not leaving, we want you. And I took the job in IT because people started calling me and, and asking. And so just building that reputation that you do a good job and being willing to take risks and go out there and do some different things and doing work you're interested in. And for me, what I'm interested in is working with people. And that just turned into to something great. This is actually the best job I've had in 28 years at the bank. So it's worked out. <laughs> and it's his fault. <laughs> Uh, it'd be easy to say ditto, so let me, let me divide into to two other pieces. One is since I'm taking a few hours uh, out of my day job to be over here with you, I have to give a paid advertisement to my client group, which is MEGA, and to tell you that the MEGA Professionals Program will again be going on next year, and we have some brochures here if you want to take a look at that, and I, I see that Roberto has some brochures down there for the, the, the Young Professionals Program, the JP, and things like that. So I have you, business cards. Get that in there <laughs> but, uh, the, the real reason I'm here, I guess, is because uh, Susan asked me to, to join, and, and Susan and I worked together at the bank for a while, and we wrote a book together uh, about job hunting, and, and in it, uh, we, we tell a story that I'd just like to quickly share with you. It's a story about going to a, a sporting event and, and trying to make the analogy of getting a job to a sporting event. And when you, when you get your tickets to that sporting event, and it says, uh, enter the arena through portal number two, and so you say, well, of all the portals I got, I have to go through number two. So all of a sudden you feel, I've been narrowed down. How unfortunate that is, I've been narrowed down. I have to go through number two. But as when you go through number two, you see now before you all the sections that are there as part of portal number two. And your ticket says, go to section M. And so you go to section M and you say, again, I'm being narrowed down. I have to go into section M. But when you get to section M, you see there are all these rows that are there for you to, to choose from. And you see on your ticket it says, I have now go to, to row KK, and oh my gosh, I'm limited to just one row. And when you get up to row KK, you see there are all these seats down that row. And you see your ticket says, you know, seat number three. And you say, my gosh, I have to sit in seat number three. And yeah, for the first half of the game, sit in seat number three, and then switch seats. <laughs> all right? The decisions we make initially are initial decisions. They have effect, but they're not lifelong effects. They can start us off, but they don't pin us down. And so look at each opportunity as the opportunity for the next that's going to come with it as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. Okay. I'd like to thank our panelists. Let's hear it for them one more time. Roberto, Bob, and Eric.